Mrs. Holmes were present. <laughs> Seals used to be up in there, keeping an eye, get out of the head. At the end of the 60s, Leotis Jones was a prisoner here in Holmesburg, a suburb of Philadelphia in the United States. A prisoner, but also a guinea pig for industry, like thousands of other inmates. H block, this is where all the medical tests and the human experimentation was going on. How many times have you taken that corridor? Oh man, that about uh, maybe 25, 30 times. You know, but there was different tests that they was running. And sometimes I was on like uh, two tests at a time, you know? Okay. This practice was confidential at the time because multinational chemical companies came here to test the risks of their products. To earn a few dollars, the prisoners participated in several tests, but none of them knew what they were being given. What they would do, they would put the tape and stick it and pull it, stick it and pull it, stick it and pull it. Then they would put a drop in the, uh, the substance, whatever it was that was in it, on that area. And what happened after? All over my body, my skin pigmentation got light in certain areas. How long did it last? About a year, somewhere around there. And they had you signing a paper stating that uh, it was informed consent, but it was just a paper to weave them from being liable if anything go wrong. One company did everything they could to keep this a secret. They even paid Leotis Jones for his silence. Dow Chemical. the leading manufacturer of plastics in the world and the third largest manufacturer of pesticides. Dow Chemical has an annual turnover of $48 billion and 50,000 employees around the globe. In the wake of this chemical giant, there's an industry of staggering profitability, an industry in a frantic race to innovate. Each year, their new toxic products reach the market. These multinationals all have one thing in common, a culture of secrecy. You're following us. Polluting lands, rivers, and groundwater. Behind the fumes of these factories, we have discovered tens of thousands of victims. In India, children are born with severe disabilities. In the US, those who have dedicated their lives to this industry Everybody wanted to go there because of, for the money, for the benefits, and it was secure. Are now paying the price. Those guys are all dead, and I should have been. Why'd they lie? Faced with these tragedies, the chemical giants have adopted a specific course of action. Lack of transparency, cynicism, denial. In the meantime, they continue to reap the profits. In Holmesburg prison, Dow experimented on the inmates with one of the most carcinogenic products in the world, dioxin. It's one of the molecules in Agent Orange, the powerful herbicide that Dow produced for the American army during the Vietnam War. The Air Force dumped it on the Viet Cong for a decade. At the same time, the tests were being performed at Holmesburg. From that time on, Dow was already aware of the dangers of dioxin. The company put it in writing in this confidential note from June 1965. Dioxin is exceptionally toxic. <laughs> Some months later, Dow would study its side effects on the prisoners. Hey man, what can I say? And there's no way in the world if they would have informed us back then that we would participate. No. No, no, I wouldn't have. 
Even Sean and Cobb are not. Even when Biden are not. We found one of the doctors that performed the tests at Holmesburg in the 1960s. Today, he's an oncologist at Northwestern Hospital in Chicago. Sigmund Weitzman is preparing to retire. He is one of the few witnesses still alive. Every day, I had a row of 20 convicts. They were coming in all day. Okay. So uh, all I, day long, people were coming oh, in? Oh, absolutely. It was a, a, a machine. In 1967, Sigmund Weitzman was only 21 years old. He was an intern at Holmesburg. The senior physician overseeing the tests never told him the names of the products used on the prisoners. He only realized later that he had administered dioxin to human beings. We show him what Dow knew back then about the chemical. <laughs> this cereal is exceptionally toxic. No wonder it's confidential. This is 50 years old. Yeah. It's very upsetting. This is the first time you, you read these documents? Yes. What, what, I'm... I'm, uh, I'm appalled. Uh, I'm just very... It's so casual. I also felt personally guilty that I was participating in something so horrible you don't give people poison. It's just simple. It's, it's, you know, as if these people aren't people. They're just experimental animals. And nowadays, it would be criminal. Dow was never prosecuted. When prisoners tried to take action against the company, the statute of limitations had expired. This multinational would not only poison inmates with dioxin, but also tens of thousands of people in Midland, Michigan, in the north of the US. Midland, the birthplace of Dow. Here at the Dow Chemical Company in Midland, Michigan, revolutionary chemical killers This is where Agent Orange was manufactured. Its production created waste extremely high in dioxin. Dow secretly dumped this waste into the river that flows through the city. In 1981, one man would discover the truth. We had a conclusion there that Dow was a major source, if not the only source, to the river, and certainly to the community, and that people were at risk. At the time, Milton Clark was a toxologist for the EPA, the government agency responsible for environmental protection. With his colleagues, he wrote a report condemning Dow's practices. But right before the report's publication, the corporation would succeed in pressuring the acting chief of the EPA in Washington. We went into shock. We had never heard of such a thing being done, ever. That the company that we were regulating, they would have the right to review a report, comment on it before it's released. And what did they ask you about that? And it was critically important to say that people were at risk, but they did not want that. They just basically want to squash the report. Okay. And eventually, the, the final report, they prevailed. And so they truncated it down and removed critical sections, and all the conclusions were taken away. Pressured by his superiors, Milton Clark was forced to censor the report. The result, pollution in Midland, Michigan, would continue for 30 years with impunity. And the executives at Dow would continue denying the dangers. There is no health problem in Midland. And there is absolutely no evidence of dioxin doing any damage to humans. In 2006, 
one woman would attack the multinational again. At the time, Mary Gade oversaw all the offices at the environmental agency in the Midland region. She had leverage. She'd been nominated by the President of the United States, George W. Bush. Newly appointed, she demands that more testing be done in the city. We found these astronomically high levels of dioxin, levels that my staff think may be some of the highest levels ever found in the United States. One of the things that was astonishing to me when this came to my attention was that for almost 30 years, this very serious problem had not actually been addressed on. Where, where have you found these high levels? So yeah, we found that in, along, in, in yards alongside the river system, parks where children play, where people launch their boats, where fishermen put their boats in the water. This is where people live. So I immediately called Dow senior officials and said, we're very concerned about these levels. We need you to take action. Um, as that unfolded, um, the, the company was not happy. It's extremely expensive to clean up this much contamination, mm -hmm. hundreds of millions of dollars, if not more. To lodge a complaint, Dow goes directly to the White House. I was asked on um, May 1st of 2008 to either resign or quit by the end of the day. OK. Were you surprised? Yes, very much so. In my 30-some years of working in environmental protection and much of that spent in the government, I, I would have never expected that. Uh, Dow was acting in its own interest, so Dow was trying to make sure that it saved as much money as possible. As a result of these maneuvers, for decades, thousands of people have lived surrounded by dioxin without knowing the risks. We wanted to meet these victims. But in Midland, it's hard to loosen tongues. Dow has supported the city for 120 years, and reminders are at every corner. At the bank, the stadium, the library, the public park, the high school. The shadow of the company is everywhere. Only one person agreed to break the code of silence. Alice Buchelter has spent most of her life here, near the river. This is where she raised her family. Oh, this is where we used to have the zip line way back here. How oh, okay. We used to have all trails that went down through here. I don't even know if you can see any of them over here. Uh, but. 18 years, and, and the land is very fertile. <laughs> and it was used for uh, motocross trails and hiking trails and dune buggy trails and, um, and just, you know, recreation in the woods. <laughs> for a kid, it's, it was like a wonderland. It was, you know, an adventure. They could explore, and they could build forts, and they could do all those things. No one advised you that there was dioxin down there? No. Nope. We just thought we found a, a magical spot for us to play and raise a family. For nearly 40 years, the Bekelter family would live here, blissfully unaware of their toxic surroundings. Every spring, the river floods their garden, bringing in a fresh wave of dioxin. Alice Bukelter would not discover the true extent of the contamination until 2007, when tests were conducted in her garden by the local environmental agency. The levels of dioxin were up to 17 times higher than the legal limit for toxicity. I have my oldest daughter has autoimmune diseases. You have Five kids? Mm -hmm. How many of them do have autoimmune uh, disease? Uh, I, I would say all of them. <laughs> um, some to a lesser degree and some to a more severe degree. And my husband had a very malignant colon cancer. It was a real quick onset. Her late husband, Herbert Brookelter, was a doctor. A few days before he passed away, he expressed a last wish. He was brave enough to, when he was dying, to have his blood drawn when he didn't have very much blood left. Dioxin levels were taken the Thursday before he died on a Sunday. He was willing to do it 
to ascertain that there was a, a connection. The results of my husband's. This is his levels. These are the actual breakdown. Alex Buchelder's husband had 64.5 nanograms of dioxin per liter of blood, three times the U.S. average. We had been married 46 years when he died. And, um, and would I have treasured 10 more years? Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's been a major impact on my life. The American Environmental Agency has finally forced Dow to clean the river. But the process has only just begun. It could take decades and cost hundreds of millions of dollars. However, no date is set for decontaminating neighboring yards like Alice Buchelter's. Dow refused all our requests for an interview. The multinational merely sent us an email stating that, we seek science-based solutions that protect human health while also contributing to the well-being of the local community. On the other side of the world, another contamination is wreaking havoc. As a result of one of the worst industrial catastrophes in history, thousands of children have been affected. But Dow has never dealt with it. It happened in India, in Bhopal. In 1984, the local chemical plant exploded, killing 20,000 people and releasing tons of toxic products. At the time, the factory belonged to Union Carbide, a pesticide giant that Dow would buy up in 2001. The site of the Bhopal explosion is still saturated with chemical pollution. Over the years, these products have spread into the city's groundwater systems. For 15 years, the inhabitants have demanded a full decontamination. In vain, Dow refuses to act. The decaying steel site is still accessible today. Here we meet Mr. Shuan, a former engineer. At the time, he was in charge of the storage of the chemicals in this laboratory. So what are all those bottles? <laughs> There's so many chemicals still remaining in this quality control lab. Very few bottles are uh, now at present. But after the disaster, this quality control lab was full of the chemicals, bottle drums, and after 32 years, still they are lying. Is that dangerous? Yeah, it is dangerous to... because there's no proper care of this premises. Among the products stored in the factory, there was lindane, an extremely toxic insecticide. Today it is forbidden all over the world. According to our guide, the soil surrounding the factory is full of it. This whole area is highly contaminated, and this is the local pit. There. They are dumping all toxic waste effluent on the ground. Right now you can feel the smell of the benzene hexachloride uh, on this spot. And it is dangerous to stay here for a long period. Benzene hexachloride is the scientific name for lindane. We go down to the area of the spill to take some samples. The smell is unbearable. We'll have the soil analyzed. Just before leaving, Mr. Schwann shows us where the pesticides were made. Here, beads of mercury lie exposed in the open air. According to the World Health Organization, this is one of the top 10 most dangerous chemical products in the world. We take some more samples. Ça se voit à l'œil nu en fait. Il y en a partout. 
The results of our two tests are astonishing. Inside the factory, the level of mercury is five million times higher than the environmental standard. At this level of concentration, the risks of developing liver, skin, or lung cancers are considerable. The levels of lindane are just as alarming, exceeding 100,000 times the standard level. This can provoke severe cases of cerebral degeneration. Yet only 20 meters away, we see children playing cricket on the contaminated ground. Hi. 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 My name is Raja. My name is Raja. Do you often come to play cricket here? Yeah. Yeah, but do, do you know that's a chemical plant that is dangerous? These children come here every day to play on the land near the factory. They don't seem to realize the risk that they are exposed to. Why are you playing inside the factory and not outside? These kids are not the only ones in danger in Bhopal. The chemical contamination stretches far beyond the walls of the factory. Toxic waste has penetrated the land and has polluted the water of many neighborhoods. Up to three kilometers from the factory, 50,000 people live there. We went to take water samples to identify the molecules present in their wells. Like in Shakya's family home. They've lived in this house for almost 30 years. The water they consume contains 1.9 micrograms of mercury per liter, two times the standard level of toxicity. In 15 minutes, we are getting dirty water and smelling water. We have to take it from the scope. 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 The problem is, even in boiled water, mercury is still carcinogenic. In other areas of Bhopal, it's not mercury, but lindane that wreaks havoc on human lives. This is a problem in Preetnagar, a neighborhood situated one kilometer away from the factory. The municipality has had drinkable water since 2011, but for many years, the inhabitants have been drinking severely polluted water. That's the case for Rukmani and her 13-year-old daughter, Rachna. Since her birth, she's suffered from limited mental development and muscular dystrophy. She can neither talk nor stand up by herself. Rukmani, her mother, drank contaminated water every day during her pregnancy. A few months after Rashna's birth, a governmental study was conducted in the area. The levels of lindane were extremely high in the water, 17 times the World Health Organization limit. Did you know that the water uh, you were drinking when you were pregnant was full of pesticide from the factory? What's going to happen to Rashna now? Who 
Due to her disabilities, Roshna has never been able to go to school. Every day she comes to the Shingari Rehabilitation Center. Without these daily exercises, she would be completely paralyzed today. Rashida B is the founder of the center. She has watched all these children grow up. Eight hundred fifty children are now registered at Rashida B's center. So is Do Chemical paying for any of this? Or Dow Chemical is there as a big lung, but she paid the hotel. I am a person who can't carry it. I am a person, I am a Yaki, Mitty Paniki, Sapai, Subse Pelecha, Uske Bad, which of Medarile, Pelis after Kurde, look, Pira Pani Lamba, Nikal Tajara, look, this is a period of Hotel. Dow Chemical Nagar Sapai Naki, Anna Valley Pretty and Boza the Barbat, Hongi, or Coffee Area Nikala. In 2015, Dow gave $4.5 billion to its shareholders, but not a single cent has been given to the decontamination of Bhopal. For weeks, we tried to reach the communications department at Dow to get an interview, without success. The water that people drink, who's going to answer those questions? It's really important. I, I'm not aware of who that is right off the top of my head. We have 50,000 employees, so I'll have to do some research. Dow never called us back. So we decided to go to the company's General Assembly in Midland, in the US, to ask our questions. Cameras are not allowed inside, so we stayed in the parking lot. Sorry, you're a Dow shareholder? Me? Yeah. Have you been talking about Bhopal this year? Were there any resolution? Excuse me, sir. Have they not to talk? Sir. What? I'm asking you to please leave the property. Uh, okay. If you refuse to leave, you will be arrested for trespass. Do you understand? Here. Do you understand? Yeah, you will I be understand. arrested. Yeah, I understand. We quickly realized that we were not welcome. Yes, sir. We're going to call this tree line right here. Okay, so I can stay there? Not going to stop traffic that's trying to exit. Okay. Right. So we carefully followed their rules for 45 long minutes until the communications department at Dow decided to finally set foot outside. Hello. Sorry to disturb you. I'm a French journalist. Yeah, we're the corporate media relations team. Ah, can we talk? No, sorry. Why? I don't have anything to say. You don't want to talk about Bhopal? You don't want to talk about the kids that are sick there? No, I'm sorry. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to say anything. Why? So we thought of another solution. We would bring our questions directly to the personal residence of the CEO of Dow, Mr. Liveris. Along with this letter, we displayed an American-style election sign to make sure that he wouldn't miss it. On va laisser un petit message à... Hello, sir. I'm not on the property here. Okay. Don't worry. Are you working for Mr. Liveris? I work for the company at Dow, yeah. Are you working for Dow? Are you concerned about... Security. Are you concerned about what's happening in Bhopal? You know they are still contaminating. Look, the kids. Mm -hmm. Look, Rashna, she's just 13 years old. It's terrible. I understand. So why Dow is not doing anything? I, I don't know, sir. Couldn't tell you. But it doesn't touch you? You don't mind? It affects everybody, sir. So why Dow is not doing anything? A few days later, we finally received an email from Dow. The company laments. Bhopal was a terrible tragedy that we will never forget. But they relieved themselves of all responsibility, stating that, we acquired Union Carbide more than 16 years after the catastrophe of 1984. 
Dow continues to address global issues through human solutions. Issues like clean water, as important as life itself. Dow is working to make water safe and readily available to people all over the globe. The human element. Nothing is more fundamental. Nothing more elemental. In Dow's wake, countless victims and human tragedies pile up without any damage to the company's profits. In December 2015, Dow announced the biggest financial operation in its history, a merger of $130 billion with another American chemical giant, DuPont. A match made in heaven. You and DuPont, there's a lot of good chemistry between us. DuPont made its fortune with dynamite. Dynamite! Nylon. And Teflon. The magical material that prevents food from sticking to pans. However, behind the success of Teflon, DuPont hides a dark secret. I just can't believe that DuPont, the money means more than people. There's people dying because of what they've done. DuPont knew years ago what they were doing. At best, it's despicable. And at the worst, it's criminal. At the heart of this drama is one city, Parkersburg. Lost in the eastern U.S. The city was built around the DuPont factory. Suzanne Bailey came here in 1978 to work on the Teflon production lines. I went to work in May the 8th, 1978. That was my glorious day, right there. They took our pictures. It's you? That's me, without gray hair. In the middle? Yep. You, you know, I was so happy. You're smiling. I was. That was the elite job. I mean, everybody wanted to go there because of, for the money, for the benefits, and everything like that. It was secure. The chemical industry is a growing one, growing by leaps and bounds. I mean, you could just mention the DuPont name and doors swung open. It was like princes coming through the door, you know? Yes, in such an environment, you can look to a bright future with confidence and optimism. Were you happy, so? I was thrilled. I was absolutely thrilled to death. A few months after starting her job at DuPont, Suzanne Bailey became pregnant. In January of 1981, she gives birth to little Bucky. When he was born, it was very traumatic. They didn't know what to do with him. They'd never seen anything like it. I could not figure out what happened. He had half a nostril, half a nose, the eye as a keyhole pupil. I didn't know what to do. I was afraid he was going to die in my arms. I had no idea what was wrong. Bucky survived. He is now 35 years old. But his childhood was spent between his home and the hospital. I had 30 surgeries in, in a span of, you know, six to seven years where they took uh, rib cartilage to form my nose. I have a metal plate here. Um, they stretched my forehead out so that they could use that skin and bring it down and mold my nose here. I still only have one, one nostril, functioning nostril. We had to put the hockey mask on him and the guards because he wasn't allowed to touch his face. For how long? 
He had to wear those for, I would say, three months, four months. It's a long time. Yeah, only, the only way that he got to take them off was just to eat. How is it, as a kid, to grow up and to have, you know, so many surgeries and, I mean, it's pretty intense, you know? Walking out in public and going into a, a store or a restaurant, and as soon as you enter, all the eyes are on you. And school, when you go in and you're trying to make new friends, um, all they see is you're different. After her maternity leave, Suzanne Bailey began to suspect her job as the cause of Bucky's deformities. A mysterious source tips her off to one molecule in particular, C8, the molecule in Teflon that stops food from sticking to pans. When I went back to work the first day, I went to the locker and I found the paper laying there. I picked it up and I began reading about it. It was talking about how the rats were fed the, the uh, C8 and what deformities that it had around their face. And I thought, that sounds just like Bucky. It was very similar to what Bucky had. Absolutely, very similar, almost identical to what he had. That's why I knew that there was something wrong. I, that's why I connect. The scientific study Suzanne Bailey found had been conducted by a subcontractor of DuPont. It studied baby rats whose mothers were exposed to C8. They developed abnormal eye lenses. I immediately walked out that door, went down to medical, and I said, is this what's wrong with my baby? Oh, no, no, no. Nothing on this plant will hurt you. That was the motto. That's what they always say. Yeah. Nothing here will hurt you. But in the meantime, DuPont was secretly investigating the pregnant women working in their factory. Two out of seven children born to the factory workers had facial deformities like Bucky. Shortly after, DuPont decided to transfer Suzanne Bailey and her colleagues to other departments. At the time, Kenton Wamsley also worked in the manufacturing department of Teflon. He remembers the discussion he had with his manager. He said, Ken, we sent all the women home out of Teflon, all of them. He said, oh, don't worry. It won't hurt the men, just the women. We feel that it, it, it can cause uh, trouble. So I thought, hmm, it won't hurt me. Kenton Wamsley was a lab technician. He handled C8 for 30 years. Breathed the fumes from them, all the samples, we breathed. But we just, you know, at the time, we, we thought well, DuPont would take care of us. And um, so I just did my jobs for years and years, you know. And we didn't realize that our health was an issue then. Surgeon diagnosed me as having uh, cancer. It had to take all my rectum, part of my colon. Were they, they're giving you that yeah. for every five years. It's just you on them, doing the same, same thing. Now Kenton Wamsley has to live with an astronomy bag attached to his stomach. He changes it day and night. At the factory, he worked in a team with three other technicians. My buddies, people I really love, seen them every day, cared about them. Those guys are all dead, and I should have been. They didn't even see retirement. No, no. Wamsley and his colleagues were never warned about the risks of C8. However, we procured a confidential document from DuPont. It's dated 1982, 34 years ago. In it, Mr. Carr, the medical director at the time, expresses concern about the consequences of C8 retained in the blood of employees. He specifically recommends that practical steps be taken to reduce this exposure. All employees, not just Teflon area workers, are exposed. So rather than to do anything, they just wrote it out. I've never seen a letter like that. I'm mad. You can see why. We could have prevented a lot of lies if they would have told us there was a problem. Why'd they cover it up? 
Why'd they lie? Why didn't they have us protected? Too costly? We track down Bruce Carr, DuPont's former medical director. He is now enjoying a peaceful retirement by the ocean, far from Parkersburg. I have a document of 1992 showing that you were aware that C8 was toxic for workers. Why have you not told them the truth at that time? They were all told the truth. <clears throat> they were told everything we knew at the time. Actually, no. I have interviewed some employees and they were not aware of anything. We told employees everything we knew as soon as we knew it. If you go back to 1982, you're trying to do reconstructions. History, and you can't do that. Why have you not protected your employees? <laughs> DuPont would not only put their employees in danger. Once again, tens of thousands of people would be affected. They live up to 70 kilometers away from the factory. One man would discover this a bit by accident. Joe Kiger. On October 31st, 2000, he receives a letter from the municipality concerning the quality of the tap water. It mentions C8. I was sitting in my courtyard, and the wife was watering the flowers, and we got our water bill in the mail, and with that bill came a letter. It's like you get form letters all the time. So you look and say, oh, okay, bang, and you put it over, and you don't think about it. Next thing you know, you throw it away. And that's basically what this was. It just caught my attention. And I started reading through it, and then the flag started popping up. First of all, what was C8 here, mm -hmm. which is used by DuPont Works? Well, what's DuPont have to do with our water? Joe Kiger sought clarification on the matter. I called DuPont to try to find out. So they put me in touch with a guy, a gentleman named Mr. Kennedy, and I said, you know, I'm, I, I'd like to know more about this C8 issue. He's just telling me it's nothing to worry about. About it was just a, a byproduct of uh, Teflon, and it wasn't anything to worry about. I mean, he was flat out lying to me, I could tell that. To get to the bottom of it, he takes DuPont to court. After a long legal battle, the judge forces the company to declassify their internal studies on C8. Joe Kiger discovers the truth behind the factory at Parkersburg. For decades, they've been dumping C8 waste into the river. To make things worse, DuPont has known since 1984 that the molecules spread into the region's tap water. The company found astronomical levels in public taps, up to 50 times the limit of toxicity, according to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. That was 1984, and we didn't come out till 2000. So, with a, 16 years. Yeah, before we even hit them up about it. And they chose, as you see right here, they chose not to do anything about it. And they knew what was coming with the liabilities if they got caught. They were trying to slide under the radar. People trusted DuPont for so long. They have done nothing but lie for years to people about what this stuff's all about. There's sick people out here because of what they've done. There's people dying because of what they've done. During all these years, more than 70,000 people have been drinking contaminated water. In 2011, both scientific research and the U.S. justice system established that C8 could cause six diseases. Thyroid disorder, high cholesterol, ulcerative colitis, high blood pressure, kidney cancer, or testicular cancer. Today, 3,500 people in the Parkersburg region are ill. They've all filed complaints against DuPont. This is the case for Earl and Gwen Botkin. Um, I've had ulcerative colitis for about 17 years, and it's about killed me a couple of times. I still have thyroid problem, and I have high cholesterol, and <clears throat> those are all associated with C8. Today, 
Earl Botkin doesn't have a colon anymore. He, too, is living with an astronomy bag. So all of a sudden, you don't function normally, but you have your bowel movement on your side. And that's what I'll live with until I die. And there's not any, not any hope of that's going to change. It controls where I go, what I do, and what I eat. It just controls a lot of things in my life. But uh, anyway, I lived through that. <laughs> A document reveals that all of these victims could have been spared. On May 22, 1984, a meeting took place at the DuPont headquarters. The directors are worried about the consequences for the inhabitants. They plan to eliminate all C8 emissions. I wanted to show you these sentences here. But finally, no measures are taken. Their argument it's not economically attractive. That was in what year? 84. That's before we were married. That's a long time ago. Uh -huh. Yeah. Long, long time ago. That's crazy. That's what makes it so bad, you know, that they had evidence all along and just disregarded it and kept doing what they were doing. It was company greed that caused this whole situation. They, they knew what they were doing to us. And they continued to do it before money. That's the only reason they continued to do it. DuPont refuses to collectively compensate the 3,500 sick people. They prefer to study the cases one by one. As a result, since 2012, only one victim has been able to get a trial. DuPont was sentenced to pay her $1.6 million the 3,499 remaining victims, like Earl Botkin, are still waiting. At the current pace of the trials, the last one would take place in 100 years. Do you still trust and you're still confident that you will get a trial at some point? Oh. If he lives long enough. Well, if I live to be 150, I might. <laughs> there will be a trial someday. But, uh, the chances of me living long enough to ever see that are probably slim to none. But we're just another document, another number of cases to be tried. DuPont has made billions of dollars. I think they should stand up to what they've done and make it right with the people they've made sick. DuPont refused all of our requests for an interview. So we drove to their headquarters in Delaware on the East Coast to convince them to answer our questions. At the other end of the line, we reached the head of media relations, Daniel Turner. We, we are doing a, a documentary piece. The best way is, you know, we meet and, and, and to, to make a proper interview, you know, at some point. But first, let's meet, you know, I'm just here. I think you can see me here. <laughs> I'm making signs. We'll respectfully decline the on-camera interview. Um, I will provide you with a statement. You know, there is like an incredible amount of documents showing that you have known at DuPont for the past 30 years that C8 was toxic and you know that you were poisoning your employees at the Washington Works plant and the Parkersburg citizen. Why are you not recognizing the fact that you have deliberately poisoned thousands of persons? Okay, so is, uh, are, are those the questions you're asking? Yeah, <laughs> this is my okay. questions. Okay, uh, I'll be uh, happy to uh, uh, provide with our statement. Today, we are in 2016. There are still 3,500 persons with severe disease that are waiting to just have the right to get a trial. I mean, for how long are you going to deny your responsibility? Are you waiting that they all die? So, uh, we will provide you with a statement for your piece. Nothing else? Uh, no? Uh, how, uh, like I said, we will provide you with a statement. Thanks so much. Have a good day. <laughs> Bye. Bye. We did receive a press release from DuPont. 
but without a single word for the victims. They claim to have studied C-8 carefully for decades and affirm to have always acted responsibly. In 2015, DuPont finally stopped using C-8. The company was also ordered by the courts to clean up the region. But how many generations are still to experience the after effects of this contamination? In the chemical world, history inexorably tends to repeat itself. It takes decades to reveal the truth, and just as many years for the multinationals to be prosecuted. In their laboratories, new toxic molecules are constantly being developed. But in 10, 20, 30, or 40 years, who knows how many new victims will be poisoned? <laughs>